quite a happy camper, and uh, I'd, you know, it's like um, I've always uh, I wonder why my books are so kind of um, you know they can be so, can be so kind of kind of crazy and bad things can happen and all that because I'm quite a happy person. But it's funny I've always found it the way. I mean, it's like the sort of um, all the the people that I know who kind of write the the, the grittiest fiction, the sort of um, the the edgy kind of urban realism tend to be quite kind of happy, easy-going sorts. It's, um, it's the poets who write about um, kind of sort of leaves and mountains and sort of, um, <laughs> and it, most of all, love that tend to be the ones that are kind of hanging off the backs of doors and the sort of, in the bed sits. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it is inhabiting the heads of characters like that, you know, when you said you end up with a story and you go, where did that come from? You sort of get all that shit out so that when you go out into the world, yeah, I mean, it's like kind of. Um, I, c I think when it, I remember, I think it comes from like when I when I kind of grew up. Um, I used to muck around with people that were there were guys that were a couple of years older than me. And when I was fourteen, because I was tall, from my age, I used to muck around and sort of kind of play football and hang around with guys that were sixteen years old. And there's a big difference between being fourteen in Scotland and being sixteen in Scotland. The, the sixteen-year-old guys are just so much kind of wilder and harder and all that and. Um, you kind of uh, you're quite intimidated in that sort of environment, that kind of thing, that sort of young gang environment at that age, and I think that um, kind of satirising these characters and sort of was a kind of way and, and, and having a laugh about some of their excesses was a kind of way of uh, of coping with that really, you know, um, making it kind of easier to sort of to operate in that environment. Why is it called reheated cabbage? Um, I don't know if there's any Italian scholars here, but there's an actual. Um, there's an actual phrase in Italy which means reheated cabbage. I, d I forget what the actual phrase is, but translated, it means reheated cabbage. And it's usually, it's usually when they talk about uh, a relationship when two people have been going out together and then they split up and they get back together again and they go, oh, reheated cabbage, you know, reheated cabbage. And it's, it's never, a, it's never a good idea, you know. It's, not, it's supposed, never supposed to be a good idea. And that's how I felt getting these stories back together again because a lot of them had gone out of print and. Uh, I thought, is it a good idea to get them back? Probably not, like, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, on that, there's, there's, in the acknowledgements, you say, um, I'm going to find it, that, that many of these have been published before and um, most of them are now out of print in their original format, usually in one of those toe curling Scotch exploitation or drug exploitation anthologies that prevailed in the 90s, for which I have to assume at least some culpability. Sorry about that. <laughs> What Scotch exploitation? Yeah, I mean, I think there was a there was a time when um, when when train spotting went sort of um, kind of huge, uh, kind of global and all that with the film and, and uh, the the plays. It was roughly at the same time when uh, James Kelman won the Booker Prize, and there was a the, you know there was a, a, a lot of other Scottish writers seemed to emerge at that time. So. Suddenly, for about kind of five minutes in the 90s, believe it or not, it was actually Vogue to be Scottish. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, know that, I know this defies every kind of, uh, all kind of logic, but believe me, it was. And uh, so everybody wanted to do an anthology of Scottish writing, you know, as soon as this. Uh, and because I knew most of the people who were involved in producing these, you know, either as um, publishers or contributors, I kind of got roped in sometimes against my better judgment into sort of contributing to them. So, you know, I mean, so I, I kind of was probably responsible for, for that kind of thing. After Train Spotting came out, because there was, the novel sold, what, a million copies in the UK alone, there was a stage play and then there was the film, which mm -hmm. pretty much everyone in the world seemed to see. You were one of the most identifiable faces of, you know, Scottish wave or Scots exploitation or whatever it was, were you constantly being rung up and asking, asked your opinion about everything to do with Scotland or everything to do with drugs? Yeah, I mean everything to do with everything, <laughs> but particularly <laughs> Scotland and drugs seemed to sort of uh, be in the forefront of people's minds when I, I mean anything that was um, any kind of sort of uh, drug, any drug death, any drug sort of policy change, any sort of uh, drug health education thing, Anything pertaining to Scotland in terms of devolution, politics, a by-election or whatever, a general election, I was kind of, um, I was asked, I mean, I could have been constantly on, a constant pundit on all these things, but it had absolutely zero appeal for me to do that. Uh, so I kind of 
tried to keep out of the way as much as I could. And after train spotting the film particularly, did you get offered a lot of work which had nothing to do with the work that you had done beforehand? People just thinking he's hot and ringing you up and saying, do you want to do this? You're talking about leading Hollywood roles, aren't you? Because of your <laughs> performance in <laughs> Train Spotting. <laughs> Come out and sit, spit it out. Yeah, right, yeah. Don't, don't. Uh, surprisingly, no, I didn't get offered many <laughs> leading, leading Hollywood parts, but I did kind of, um, I did kind of uh, get. Um, I think the, the the other thing about Train Spotting was it was um, in the nineties it was kind of co-opted into like everything was really it was co-opted into all this uh, Cool Britannia thing that was, um, which was kind of I never really understood it in that way at the time, but basically um, Cool Britannia was Britain's last stand. Uh, it was like a requiem for British culture because I think everybody that was involved in it was clued up enough to know what was going to happen with globalisation and that um, the culture of, you know, the British culture that kind of gave the, wo the world like everything from kind of Teds to Mods to sort of to Punks to, to Acid House to Football Casuals, all that was going to go and we're going to be in a, a culture that was not going to be dominated by come up from the streets basically but was going to be about um, dominated by media and dominated by marketing. Um, and uh, so I think we kind of realised that was what was happening so it was basically uh, that was the last stand of kind of putting everything together into you know that, that, that had come from Britain that was kind of decent and um, you know sort of celebrating it basically but it was more it felt more like a funeral basically it was like a, a, big, a kind of big kind of um, a big mad wake for British culture Britpop I think I think that um it's got very boring, globalisation. It's got very bland and boring and samey, and, uh, and culture's got that way as well. And uh, I think the only thing that can actually rescue global culture and make it interesting is to start going local again, you know, because it's, it's kind of dying on its feet now. I mean, how many kind of, um, kind of pop idols, American idols, Australian idols and all that do we need sort of shoved down our throat all the time? And, I mean, I think it's really... Uh, we need, you know, I think, I think we're kind of... Um, it's nice to sort of um, to think that th there could be local cultures emerging again that are not sort of um, completely, you know, culture needs a place to breathe and it doesn't really get that now with the, with the, you know, the World Wide Web and the sort of global marketplace. It's, like it's just taken away and thrust, and inferior versions of it are basically thrust in the throat before, we can, before it gets a chance to find its feet. Um, and I think that's the only thing that's going to make the world interesting again. Otherwise, we're... You know, we're all going to sort of um, kind of run around and pick up guns and start shooting each other just for something to do, because, because it, it's just getting so boring. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of the characters in Reheated Cabbage are picking up guns and, well, essentially picking up anything they can find and running around, either taking it or throwing it at each other or... A great combination of those two things. Is it because they're bored? Is it because they need stories in their lives and if those stories have to be bad, so be it? I think so. I mean, I, I think the, um, the thing is that um, everybody's the centre, we're all existentialists, everybody's the centre of their own world and um, I think it's true that everybody does need a compelling drama in their life and uh, I think that, you know, when you see kind of uh, kids from sort of... Uh, really kind of cut off deprived ghettos right across the west who are kind of um, they're not just picking up the gun in the sort of uh, in the bag of coke and 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 selling it because be, be because they have to because there's, there's no there's nothing else there there's no economy the black economy is the only way to get by but also the excitement of it and the, the compelling drama of being involved in something like that um, because there's no other opportunity really to to get involved in anything else and it kind of wins by default uh, so that's uh, that's the sort of uh, that's the sad thing. I mean, I kind of um, I wrote this article about kind of uh, kind of crime and violence in Scotland as a as a result of uh, a UNESCO study, which showed that it become the most violent society in in the Western world, and that's without guns. There's no guns there. It's all knives as well, which is kind of even more scary. And I was saying that um, the number of funerals that are gone to in the last year, basically the the, the the, ch the children of um, people that I know who have kind of died in their teens through knife crimes and uh, or who've been incarcerated through through kind of uh, perpetuating these crimes and you think I mean it, even when I was um, 
when I was young, growing up in the same places, it kind of wasn't like that to that extent. I mean, there was always um, that thing could that could always kind of happen, but it wasn't like an epidemic. And as well as as well as the odd kind of kind of uh, funeral and stabbing and sort of that, you also had people graduating. You had people going to university, and you you, you could attend graduation ceremonies as well as um, as well as funerals. <laughs> Uh, so it made things a bit more interesting, but now it's just no. There's no graduation ceremonies in places like Muir House. It's all funerals, you know. So, um, and I think that uh, the way the way poorer places in, in the West, in, in Britain particularly, have become so one-dimensional, uh, it's very very sad because um, they were when I grew up in communities like that, they always had the problems, but they were, they were, they were always vibrant and they were always quite quite multi-dimensional. Now they're very, very one-dimensional. There's nothing else uh, except the black economy, the underground economy, the drugs economy. In one of the stories in Ricky Cabbage called State of the Party, um, Callum meets an old friend, Bobby, who's basically an irredeemable junkie. And no matter what happens to Callum throughout the story, which is quite a considerable amount of shit goes down, he can't stop thinking about all his friends who got on the gear and died for various reasons. Was there a bit of was one of the reasons that you started writing, was it in a way to remember your friends that had gone and to alert people to the fact that people were dying? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to make sense of a, a basically an epidemic in a place that I grew up in. And um, I was trying to make sense of the fact that um, I mean, when, when I started taking heroin, that uh, people used to, you know, people, I, was, I was in with this kind of weird sort of kind of little crowd that hung around down Leith. And people where I grew up used to laugh at me, you know, and they would they would go down for their they would go down for their um, you know their, their pints of tenants lager, and you know they, they might have a, they might have a very few of them would even smoke dope. They even, you, you know, there was no drugs at all where, uh, where I grew up, and um, it, people just <coughs> people used to laugh at me and say I was stupid, and I was. But um, when I got off heroin and I was living down in London, and then a, a, bit, a couple of years later I was back up, and everybody was on it. You know, everybody who said that I was daft at the time, and I was, was kind of um, was was killing himself with heroin, and with not 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 so much just with with the heroin, but uh, the fact that HIV and AIDS had got into the the intravenous drug using community at the time and uh, spread like kind of uh, like a bushfire because at that time it was almost exclusively this is like the early eighties, eighty three, eighty four, it was almost exclusively promoted as a gay man's disease, and nobody knew that um, people could get it from sharing needles, which, which we d they did in Edinburgh because the, um, the needle exchange was shut down uh, by the local constabulary and, you, uh, and people used to steal the industrial syringes from hospitals and just inject blood for blood without realising the consequences. So there was this, um, it, there was this massive, uh, people were just dropping down dead like flies and if it, had a, if it had happened in a posh part of Edinburgh like Morningside, there would have been an outcry about it, but it was almost because it happened in Muir House. There was almost just this conspiracy of silence. I mean, the local newspapers and the local media took so long to even acknowledge that uh, there was a problem here. Um, it took uh, it took this GP, uh, local GP, who did a report on it to to bring it to national attention, and um, it also kind of I, th I suppose in some ways it also took the, the novel Train Spotting to bring it to national attention too. I'm kind of happiest when I do. I mean, I'm happiest when I sort of get up early and um, sort of have a bit of exercise and then a bit of breakfast and then sit down and just um, <coughs> do stuff in the morning because the morning's quite a good time for me. I get I kind of get a lot done then. But um, I'm incredibly uh, I'm not so much, I'm I'm disciplined to the extent that I put out a tremendous amount of what and I, sp I spend a lot of time writing. But I'm very very undisciplined in terms of kind of um, it always seems to gravitate towards the evening, you know what I mean? It's like I'm much better in the morning, but it always seems to gravitate towards the evening. I always seem to end up sitting up, um, you know, sort of not being able to sleep and sitting up at four o'clock in the morning typing away and, you know, and um, it's like I, I kind of, I don't know what I must I do to these keys, but um, I must pound those, those keys because the wife always comes up and says, look, you know, go to bed or or just don't hit the keys so hard, or get <laughs> get this room soundproofed and something like that. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's kind of uh, you know, it's it's kind of it's, it's not a 
But I get to a kind of critical mass with the book, it, it kind of takes over and, you know, it's like basically, uh, I do kind of write till I drop in a way, you know, I mean, um, she, she'll kind of come in and pick me off the floor and sort of kind of drag me to bed and sort of make me some, um, give me some uh, paracetamols or something like that, my head will be throbbing away. So I don't have a, I don't really have a healthy relationship with writing, to be honest. <laughs> do you write? one thing all the way through or have you got tons of things in different states I've got to, go? I've got quite a lot of things in different states um, sometimes if you're writing a novel a novel size thing that um, it doesn't really the you know you, you go up on a tangent and it's a nice tangent but you think this is this branch I'm going to break off and it's going to become another story or another novel to to work on later and sometimes you get so obsessed with the branch that you forget the kind of um, the tree, and you, you realise that that's the thing I really wanted to write all along. You know, it's the thing that I planned and worked out isn't really what I want to do, and this is what I want to do. When you first started writing, did you, um, and this is to paraphrase Ray Bradbury, did you just jump off a cliff and construct your wings on the way down? Because it sounds yeah. you obviously you do have an obsessive relationship with writing. So did you just go, I'm going to write, and it was on? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great quote from Ray Bradbury. It's, fun, it's kind of when I was teaching writing, it's one I use quite a lot because I can, I can, I see the, you know, I see the sense in it and I, s I see the, the, the validity in it. I mean, it's, I think it is roughly what I did because um, nobody, I mean, if you look at, if you go into a shop and you want to, you want to become a writer, there's a million books that will tell you how to write a screenplay because the screenplay is all structure really, but there's not, the novel is seen as something a bit more kind of um, ethereal and sort of mysterious and um, it's kind of, uh, there's not a, a kind of, you know, there are books that tell you kind of, you know, how to write a novel and there are software in there that tells you how to write a novel but nobody's convinced that they're any good or they're going to help you write a novel. Uh, I think you do just, um, there is an element of that, you do have to find your, because I, th I think to me the novel, like a literary novel is um, not so much genre fiction because genre fiction is very, very plot oriented, but a, li a, li a so called literary novel, I don't want to be all high church about it, but um, a kind of fi a novel of basic standard fiction, to me, what distinguishes it from genre fiction is its, um, is its influence, is its kind of concentration on character, its concentration on the characters and the psychology of the characters and the, the interplay of the characters. Um, and uh, to me, that, that's the sort of, um, that's the mystique of it, and it's not. It's not really so much to do with structure. I mean, the um, the screenplay is very structure oriented, so it's, it's, e it's very good to pick up a book on how to write a screenplay because it is so structure biased. But the novel, I think, is about character. So I think it's um, it's more about uh, understanding the sort of the, you know the machinations and the interactions of characters.